Now I'm going to introduce our moderator for the entire morning session. She is someone who I have enormous respect for, Janie Hipp, who is uh, at the University of Arkansas in the law school. And Janie is someone who many of you know, and the reason I know that is because she can always be found sitting at a table or in a chair holding court as people come up and speak to her. So she is extremely well known and uh, will be moderating both of these sessions. There will be no break this morning. There will be no formal break. So if you need to leave, please just quietly do so and come back when you can. And the morning session will end at 12.30, after which we will have lunch as we did on the other days. So now I would like to introduce Janie, who in addition to being brilliant and wonderful in so many ways, has the very best choice in color of clothing to wear. Janie. Good morning, everybody. Are y'all awake yet? Let's try that again. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Yes, that's better. That's better. Thank you all so, so much for being here and to our hosts, uh, the Shakopee people and this amazing place that we're gathering in for the second year in a row. Um, I don't know about you all, but I really look forward to this meeting and gathering. Um, and part of the reason why I look forward to it so much is because um, for far too long in my work, um, my passion, um, the discussions of, of the foods is missing from the discussion of nutrition. And I know that may, for many of you, seem, why is she saying that? Um, but if you've ever you know, heard me talk, um, I, I, I make a point to say that we're not going to heal these uh, nutrition and health problems that we have unless we go all the way back to the food itself, which requires us <laughs> um, to go all the way back to the land and all the way back to the water and all the way back to the health of the, of the ecosystem or however you want to term it um, that our foods are found in. And so I'm very excited about the panel this morning. And just as a matter of, of business, because uh, Mindy makes me do business, even when I don't want to, um, just um, another reminder to enter your questions on, on pigeonhole. Thank God I didn't have to learn how to use pigeonhole. I've avoided it like the plague, and I, <laughs> I still don't know how. So I'm trusting that you know how. <laughs> and, but enter your questions for sure during each talk and during the Q&A. Um, and vote on the questions that you'd like to be asked. Uh, we're gonna use that system to kind of field questions as we have throughout. There's not gonna be a Q&A session after each speaker because um, I'm more concerned about making sure those speakers have their full time. And so you're gonna notice that I'm gonna refer you right now to your program. I'm not gonna read their bios. And I apologize ahead of time to any of our speakers who wanted me to read their bios, but I'm gonna avoid that. I think all of us here would rather hear from them instead of me. So without further ado, um, we're gonna get going. And Mindy, where is our timekeeper? Okay. All right, so if you see me lurking behind any of our speakers at any point, you'll know that I'm getting ready to tap them on the shoulder because we've been cued <laughs> that it's time to keep going because there's so much to cover in this, um, this component of the program. So let's start with Devin. Uh, Devin, are you here? Are you back there? <laughs> uh, Devin, I, I, I don't know very well. But I understand that my boss, Stacy Leeds, knows you very well. Mm -hmm. And so we're thrilled to have you here, and I'm going to let you uh, get going. Okay. Halito, Chimachukma, Sahajifa Ut, Devin Mahisua. And um, I want to um, thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity and I've met some uh, really interesting people and listened to a lot of interesting talks. 
Um, what I have up here first um, is for your information. I, I run the American Indian Health and Diet Project at the University of Kansas. And uh, what I have done for the last, well now, seven years is a week of indigenous eating. And I started this in 2011 um, in honor of Martin Reinhardt, um, who is in uh, Michigan. Um, he runs the Decolonized Diet Project. And so Martin and uh, um, his colleagues, they decided that they were going to spend an entire year eating only Anishinaabe foods. And so in honor of that very arduous um, challenge that he underwent, I thought, why don't we do something that's a little less stressful? So um, if any of you are interested in doing this, you can look at my indigenous eating page on Facebook, uh, the American Indian Health and Diet Project, and it is uh, November the 19th through the 26th. So you can, if you want to, you can eat foods um, only from your tribe for an entire week, foods only from the hemisphere, this hemisphere for a week, or maybe just one indigenous meal per week. But the whole idea is to get people thinking about their traditional food ways and to ask questions and to do some research. Well, I also wanted to start this off, you know, enthusiastically, um, so we can remember who we're doing this for. Um, this is my son in the garden who is always very excited when he finds something. So uh, Tosh is a little bit older now, but he still gets very excited when he, when he finds things. So here we go. Now, the effects of relocation on food access and nutrition, um, this can be a very tough topic, and it is a very complex topic with a lot of complex issues. And um, if any of you have read... Um, what I've written in the last 30 years on decolonization, uh, you know that I don't avoid um, the hard issues, and so I'm not going to avoid them today, and um, so we'll see what happens. I, I hope I don't get any rotten produce thrown at me, but we'll see. Now, before we can talk about um, what happens after you remove, we have to talk about where you have come from, and that is the importance of place, the importance of your homeland. Your homeland determines your identity. It's a site of creation, your ceremonies, the site of burials, or how it is that your tribe honors those that have passed on. It's a site of medicinal plants, site of remembrance, and it's also synonymous with indigenous knowledge. Now, indigenous knowledge, also known as tick and tech, traditional indigenous knowledge, traditional environmental or ecological knowledge, now, tribes didn't use these terms, okay? We're using these terms. They just called it living, right? This is local decision-making about fundamental aspects of your day-to-day -day life, hunting, fishing, gathering, uh, seed saving. Also, instructions on how to behave as a member of the group. It connects people to their culture and therefore to the natural world. And your indigenous knowledge is expressed in a variety of ways, song, dancing, ceremonies, rituals, community laws, through your language, and also through your agricultural and hunting practices. Now, in order to sort of impress this upon uh, my students, uh, non-native students especially, uh, maybe some of y'all remember this, um, 2005 in India, because there are indigenous peoples around the world, um, the isolated islands, Anadaman and Nicobar, um, there was an earthquake and consequent uh, tsunami, and over 7,000 people you know, perished. And the reason I bring this up is there was a group of people who lived there, the Jarawas. The Jarawas had knowledge of the tides, the animal behavior, the weather patterns. They knew what was about to happen. All of them escaped. So while other people, tourists, are standing out there in the surf, taking pictures, watching the waves roll in, and all of these people die, every one of those Jarawas survived. Maybe you all remember this picture. Uh, some of you all may be too young. Um, can you tell what that is? They don't like contact with the outside world. So that is a man pointing an arrow, you know, at the helicopter that's going by. This should also look familiar to you, because something happened very recently in South America, didn't it? Um, there's pictures of Native people um, who were doing the same thing, and they had been killed um, by miners in, in Brazil. When we talk about relocation, 
uh, and removal. There are many forces at work. This is not just a case of you have been removed from your homeland and now you don't have access to adequate uh, nutritional resources. The relocation was fueled by political, economic, religious, racist motivations. And these forces all came together and they affected food resources, among many, many other things. The examples I'm going to use today are the five tribes, um, also known as the five civilized tribes, although most of them don't like that term because it's not necessarily complimentary. Uh, my husband's Comanche. He's, he's uncivilized, but um, that doesn't bother him. Um, <laughs> so the five tribes, we're talking about Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Muscogee Creek, um, and Seminoles. And Indian Territory became the state of Oklahoma in 1907, so I might use this um, interchangeably. Congress passed the Indian Removal Act in 1830, and it was enthusiastically approved by Andrew Jackson. Okay. Yes, so um, as, we, as we can see and as we do know, <laughs> um, history repeats itself. <laughs> Sorry, I debated on that. I had more pictures, but I took those out. Um, at least 46,000 Native people were removed uh, from east of the Mississippi, and thousands of people perished. Um, many of them died along the way, but many of them died once they arrived in Indian Territory. Um, they came across, you know, very, you know, uh, arduous circumstances. They were, you know, starving. Uh, some people moved in the dead of winter. The removals were 185 years ago, give or take a year, uh, but the memories are still very fresh. Repercussions are still being felt, and I'll give you some examples here. Um, Y'all are familiar with End of the Trail um, that Fraser created. Uh, this is the, the cast that is in Oklahoma City. It's in the Cowboy um, Hall of Fame Museum, and it's very big. It's huge. Um, there's, there's also, um, this is in uh, Wisconsin, I think, and then another one in California. Now, the reason I'm showing this is because in Indian Territory, in Oklahoma today, many people use this image. They have pictures on their walls, but they've changed it a little bit. So they've got a picture of the horse and the exhausted man covered in snow. They're coming through the deep snow. They're making it across the trail. So they have adopted this very sorrowful image as their own, and they apply it to the removal trail. A uh, trail of tears is usually... Um, Probably what you've heard, the Cherokees refer to it as that. The Choctaws call it the trail where they cried. It's the same, same concept. This uh, removal has you know, personal connotations to me because the third person from the top on this list, my ancestor, signed it. <laughs> um, it's called Treaty with the Choctaw, but it's also known as the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. And treaties were named for where the treaty was signed. And what is this? Okay, uh, this is a little sugar bowl, and many of these people who came across the trail tried to bring with them as much as they could, and there are stories of people who brought a piano, you know, their entire furniture set, and then it didn't take very long to figure out they weren't gonna get far, so they started dropping things by the side of the trail. So this trail was littered, you know, with personal belongings, and, and later um, human, you know, the people had, had died. This is um, one little piece that survived, um, that my family had, that had a um, little china set. So this is a little broken sugar bowl. And the reason I mention this is because um, it was passed to my, my aunt, and then when she died, it passed to my cousin. And when she died last year, it was passed to me. So I came home, brought it home, put it on top of the, the fireplace hearth. And about a year ago, there was an earthquake. <laughs> And it rattled our house in, uh, we live in Baldwin City, Kansas, which is a little bit south of Lawrence. And uh, the picture frames on the walls moved. And I thought, oh my gosh, the sugar bowl. So I ran and got it. And so now the sugar bowl is sitting on the, on the floor. And I never thought I would say that we now have earthquake insurance, uh, but we do. And the other reason I bring this up is because that earthquake emanated from Oklahoma. 
And as some of y'all probably know, because some of you live there, uh, fracking has become you know, a very serious issue in Oklahoma. Um, over 600 earthquakes, I think, occurred in Oklahoma last year, 900 the year before. So this is one of the very serious problems that Native people and everybody else are having to deal with. The Roads of My Relations, I've written a lot of books, but this was my first novel. And if you look at the cover here, this, these are people who are being removed. It kind of fit the story perfectly. And the thread that runs through this novel and why it's pertinent to what we're talking about today is how these people survived in sustenance. And the heroine of the story as we first start out um, way back in 1820 is Willie, and she's carrying water to her gardens. And the thread that goes all the way through this book up into the present generation is that everybody in the family tried to emulate that garden. It was a connection to culture, it was a connection to family, and it was their sustenance. So after the removal, um, Will, uh, Willie's granddaughter, Billy, first thing she did, um, it was the dead of winter and the ground was hard. She gets out of that wagon and she starts clawing in the ground. Her, you know, Papa says, what are you doing? I'm trying to get the garden started, which didn't make any sense because it was in January. But to her, it was such a psychological um, tie to culture, tie to tradition, we've got to get We've got to get this started. So um, it's quite, quite emotional. At one time, there were more than 60 tribes in Indian Territory. Today, in Oklahoma, there's 39. This is for your test afterwards. Um, and you can see how far these people came. So it wasn't just the five tribes. Uh, there are Modocs from California. Um, you had Delawares coming from you know, the Northeast. So Indian Territory was, is really, you know, historically has a, has a very rich, vibrant, important history, many, many important cultures that most people really don't know about this particular history. But for our purposes today, remember all these people were removed. The five tribes, after they, after they got here, they reestablished their governments, they built homes, created their gardens. And many of them were fortunate enough to find um, that where they ended up was very similar to their homelands. Waterways, forest, fertile soil, lots of game, lots of fish. The flora and fauna was quite similar to what they were used to. Now, not, not everybody had that advantage. I'm just talking about those people who ended up in, say, the eastern part of Indian Territory, which is very lush. Today, Oklahoma has more sh shoreline than Minnesota. But most of that, most of the lakes in Oklahoma are man-made. But still, that's kind of a, a fun factoid. Um, there was a variety of nut and fruit trees. And this is what, this is, this is really important because right after removal, a lot of these people could just walk right outside their door. They had all kinds of things to eat. And some people did not, but those who did actually found themselves you know, rather pleased and rather fortunate. And where do we find this information? In um, the 19, 1930s, the WPA conducted a series of almost 80,000 interviews with residents of Oklahoma. And a lot of these people were quite elderly, so it was Indians and pioneers. So a lot of Native people gave testimony um, and they were telling stories of their grandparents who came across the removal trail. They told stories about growing up in Indian Territory. And they would, they would say things like, I could walk out my door and there'd be turkeys roosting right in the tree. There are deer laying out in the yard. So one person actually said, you were just flat out lazy if you couldn't go out and get some meat. Um, Oklahoma, uh, very green, very lush. So these are just pictures that are kind of... Uh, to illustrate that, but you see some cows in there, so they play an important role here. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention on my American Indian Health and Diet Project site, what I did, um, I took a look at all the, um, as many as I could find, <clears throat> medicinal plants and a lot of the foods that the tribes had in the east, and then I looked at what did they have in the west. And so I created spreadsheets, there's three to four 500 pages, spreadsheets, I guess, of what the five tribes had. So if you're ever interested in, in taking a look at this, um, you may want to go to my site and check that out. How health changed. First on the agenda was to recover. 
Thousands were ill, many died, and were buried right after arrival, like I mentioned before. And they quickly realized that this land was not theirs. It didn't belong to them. By treaty it did, but this is what I mean. By the 1840s, tribes began to see their resources diminishing. Deforestation, damming, overhunting, overgrazing, poaching, mining, and later on, the railroads. We know this. Um, you can take a look at the constitution and laws of the, of the tribes. And this is Cherokee, uh, Cherokee laws, the Cherokee syllabary. And they were having to pass laws because what was happening, so many people were coming in and cutting down their trees in the middle of the night and then putting the trees in the rivers and the Illinois River pushing the trees downstream. So you wake up in the morning and your trees are gone and there's nothing really you can do about it. So they realized very early on they better start doing something about their resources because they're starting to lose them. Um, a good example of this is Sugarloaf Mountain. Um, it's the 28th most prominent peak in the U.S. It's only about, I don't know, 2,500 uh, feet high. In the mid-1800s, this was advertised as an oasis. Springs, there were black, black bears, pollinators, deer, turkeys, all kinds of things to eat. And non-natives from around the country would come to Sugarloaf Mountain, that's what it looks like today, um, to put their feet in that cold water. But something very quickly happened. As you can see, um, we'll go back, uh, ranch land, farmland, Um, my family settled, settled here in a place called Kulichaha, which is at the base of Sugarloaf Mountain, and this is a cemetery. You can kind of see it off in the distance. But here's an important picture. You look down at this, and today what you see is farm and ranch land. So this is really, it, it started, people started encroaching on this and cutting things down and taking the animals, shooting the deer. And so what we have today um, is sort of a continuation of what started happening back then. The cows came in, started destroying the land, and here is a picture that I caught off the web last week. Um, so this deforestation and the environmental destruction continues. Now, much of this destruction in Indian territory was done by non-Indian intruders, but much of it was done also by Native people for profit. So the results of removal, um, environmental degradation, population reduction, loss of resources, and also the psychological aspects from depression and anguish, loss of identity and cultural confusion, but also intertribal factionalism. And this is, this is something that continues today. Nationalists and progressives. The nationalists tend to be, tended to be the ones who were very much against the white folks coming in to intermarry in the tribe. Uh, they were against the railroads. It became very, very difficult to make decisions because the progressives wanted people. You know, they were, wanted people to come in. They wanted to make money. They were more acquisitive. And violence erupted. Uh, Indian Territory became one of the most violent places in the country, particularly after the Civil War. And if you read the novel True Grit, um, and especially if you saw the second movie, um, you'll see, you'll know that that is quite violent. Uh, Charles Portis's novel took place in the violence of uh, the Choctaw Nation. So murders, rapes, thefts were very common, and most people carried weapons. And I've written two books about this, and the reason that I'm telling you about all of this is because they couldn't make decisions, and you have people now who are very affluent. You've got people who are affluent, people who are very poverty stricken. You've got cultural upheaval, a loss of cultural knowledge. And this is all going on within the same tribe and people are all fighting each other. Some people have resources, some people don't have any resources. Here we start seeing very dramatic health changes. So um, very quickly by 1850, some Cherokees had one 128th degree Indian blood. So if we, t if we carry that down now to today, that, would mo that might be one four thousandths and something degree, but you can still be a member of the tribe. So why in the world would I, why would I, why would I bring that up? Well, it's because a lot of Native people are starting to become influenced by other people's opinions and their food choices. People are moving away from their tribal traditions. The majority of the people in the Choctaw Nation today, there's 233,000 people in the Choctaw Nation, but the majority of the people who live there aren't even Choctaws, okay? So who's, you know, so this, this brings up a lot of questions and, and uh, has brought up a lot of 
concern. In Oklahoma, as long as, if you're a white person and if you are in a household, and as long as one person is a member of a federally recognized tribe, then you can receive commodities in the um, food distribution program. So again, uh, this brings up the question as to who is influencing who in regards to um, what you're eating. So the loss of food waste knowledge is in many times directly related to acculturation via intermarriage, boarding schools, missionary efforts. And I'll bring up this as an example, the Cherokee Female Seminary in Tahlequah. Uh, this was established in 1850, and the first teachers were from the Northeast, and they taught Shakespeare, um, Latin, chemistry. This is in the 1850s. Nothing about Cherokee culture, no ceremonies, English only. And this is the Cherokee tribe. They were doing it to themselves. What they did have, however, was a lot, of, a lot of food, a lot of food, because there, some people were rather affluent. Cakes, pies, butter, cream, candy. Uh, they would serve this every single day. What started happening, and I have written you know, extensively about this, uh, the medical superintendent, we have really good records on this, these girls, and there was a Cherokee male seminary too, they suffered from some food-related problems, everything from constipation to diarrhea, um, maybe acne, bowel complaint. Um, all the girls were complaining about this. And of course, at that time period, they didn't use the term, you know, they didn't use um, celiac disease or lactose intolerance. Um, they also didn't often use the term diabetes either. Also, irregular menstrual periods, and the, the doctors would be talking about as early as, you know, 1880s, that these girls are getting a little heavy because they're not exercising enough. So this is, this is in the 1880s already. So not just at the Cherokee Female Seminary, but it's other people throughout the uh, tribal nations who could afford to, they, would start, they started using more flour and more sugar, cream, canned goods. Whereas those who are more impoverished, some of them were kind of relegated to mono diets. Some people only had access to corn. So even if they use wood lye ash in their corn, you're not going to survive very long if that is all you're eating. What has happened is their natural resources have diminished, and that's all they have. So what we have then, even prior to the Civil War, is just unprecedented health problems. And we also know this because if you look at Indian Territory newspapers during that time, the, the proliferation of ads for tonics and all these things that are going to cure you um, really show up. Thousands of ads, as a matter of fact. Diabetes is referred to as the thirst. Most people didn't know what to call it. Um, I wrote an article uh, re sort of re refuting, I suppose, Kelly M. West, and he's known as the father of uh, diabetes epidemiology. And he had a theory that diabetes was unknown among tribes prior to 1940. Um, and this simply is not true because there's just so much evidence to show that this really started um, even pre-diabetes before the Civil War. So um, if anybody is interested, there's, there's the citation. And if you, if you feel differently, please, please let me know about this. So as, as time goes by very quickly, um, many people become dependent on commodities. There is poverty. And there's a difference between, say, you know, poverty from your perspective. You may be perfectly happy not having all kinds of things. Um, I'm talking about poverty where you really do need things. So this is uh, people who are in need. Food deserts, uh, GMOs, fracking. Um, 54 lakes as of, well, a few days ago um, in Oklahoma are um, polluted with mercury. It seems to change every day. You know, something else happens in Oklahoma constantly. Invasive species, um, the loss of pollinators. You know, this is a true problem. We're losing the pollinators everywhere. So the loss of cultural knowledge um, is a real, real contributor here. And your lack of knowledge about the significance of those foods and the connection to the culture is one of the prime reasons for the problems that we're finding. So what is traditional food? Um, we could spend a conference talking about this. Is it the foods you like or is it pre-contact foods? So I address this in, in another, another article if you're interested. I'm going to put this up here because if you go to the Choctaw Nation and you take a look at the website, they have traditional foods, traditional Choctaw foods. And um, if you take a look at these ingredients, you may question, well, exactly what's traditional about that, particularly the sweet potatoes. And as you know, sweet potatoes and yams are not the same thing. 
But here we've got two cups of sugar and one cup of flour for sweet potatoes that are perfectly fine by themselves. And I was going to put a picture of fry bread up here, but I never know what's going to happen when I do that. So, uh, <laughs> so um, five counties in the Choctaw Nation are among the poorest in the U.S. However, the tribe pulled in $670 million last year. So yes, the question is, why? <laughs> Why? Um, there are a group of, of Choctaws in particular who are trying to figure that out. But here's something to think about. Um, with all the, the food movements that are going on and all the seed saving, um, which is very important, we also need to keep in mind that not every tribe had an agricultural tradition. Uh, Comanches, for example, uh, that's Maihisua on the left, Kwana Parker on the right. Um, in the 1870s, the Comanches um, were forced to settle at Fort Sill, and they didn't have access to bison, um, antelope, or deer. And they were forced to um, depend on these inadequate government rations that were at some times you know, pretty horrible, as we have all heard about. So they don't have an agriculture or uh, seed-saving traditions to revitalize. So what are they going to do? So we get back to to where we started, isn't it? Uh, tribal food sufficiency involves a complex mesh of social, political, religious, in, you know, environmental, and economic concerns. And this is why it is so difficult. It's not just a matter of go plant a garden and problem solved. Um, people have to really dig in and get in there and, and fight politically and socially. It's not easy, and it's very exhausting, too. Some of you probably know. Um, and I'm going to throw this out here, indigenous food sovereignty. Um, some people are really questioning this term. Why are we using the food, you know, the, the term sovereignty? Because during the removal period, it was the Marshall Court um, in Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, Worcester versus Georgia. It's out of that time period that the Marshall Court determined that tribes were domestic dependent nations. So yes, you are a nation. But does that mean you are truly sovereign? If you know what that term sovereign means, you don't have sovereignty, and you never will, because that means you're not answerable to the United States government. And the government does have control over tribes. It's the United States that's allowing you to use that term. So that, that's a topic, I think, for another conference, maybe. Um, the other thing I would want to point out is that just because we have a lot of commentary by people who say historically you know, the tribes look very robust and they look very healthy, um, this also does not mean that once we get our food ways solved that everything's going to be great and wonderful. I think that a lot of people who are new to the food movement also think, well, maybe, you know, historically everything was just perfect and health was pristine, and it really wasn't because resources were not available to everyone. You still had diseases and wounds and broken bones and bites and stings and infections, etc. Uh, you break a tooth, you know, you, you're still going to be in trouble. Still, didn't have diabetes, probably no high blood pressure, I, obesity, it's probably quite rare. And a question, um, you know, the million dollar question is, can traditional indigenous knowledge that solve past environmental and health problems also solve modern day issues? And I think that's what a lot of people in here are attempting to um, discover. So the challenge is not to find Yakni Achukna, which is, you know, the good land. The goal is to rediscover or revitalize our understanding of the good land, how to live with the land and the environment, how to make people appreciate it more, and how to revitalize and how to maintain it. That is the natural world. Recover this indigenous knowledge, and in order to do that, you absolutely have to engage those people who have knowledge of traditional culture, and that is, those are your elders. So we need, you know, short version, varied diet, unprocessed foods, access to culturally related flora and fauna, unpolluted water, soil, air, medical care of traditional and modern medicine. Everybody needs access to that. And you probably cannot read this, but this is my little chart that's sort of ongoing. And it, you know, when I first started, I only had about six or seven things. And I think if we had a group project here, this would probably end up looking like the Milky Way or the stars, you know, of the pier. Um, so, and if you're going to have a happy, healthy life, you know, you need a variety of things. And so that's, that's the question. How are we going to do it? And that's why everybody is here, presumably. So, 
And then just a few happy pictures of kids in the garden again. Uh, boys can, can do three sisters' gardens. That's my son. Kids finding things. That's always fun, right? So anyway, that's what I have. Thank you very much.